God is good. All the time. Yes, all the time. God is good. We thank God for his mercies. Yes, Lord. We thank you for, for coming. And uh, God, virus or no virus, mm -hmm. God is still God. Yes, sir. God is still sitting on the throne. That being said, please take care of yourselves. Take all the reasonable precautions. It's it's a simple thing. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a virus, just like a flu virus. So wash your hands. You know, social distance. Put on your mask. But I'll tell you one thing: you can do as well. Make sure you are. Make sure that you are all stocked up on your vitamins. Oh, yes. Your vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc. Yes. Especially now we know with the, with the winter time, the vitamin D is low. With us African Americans, mm -hmm. vitamin D is really low. But when we're staying indoors all the time, we're not, we're not out in the sun. So make sure you buy that, uh, those supplements for the vitamin D take that every day you know I, I we do that in my family we take my son thinks it's a juice he loves the because we mix it up it's a vitamin it's called the vitamin immune immunity plus mm -hmm. because that's what it is with this virus it's just to make sure your, your immune system is boosted up so that it deals with it mm -hmm. the immune system that's what the vaccine does mm -hmm. the vaccine is to help your immune system fight the virus but you can also boost your immune system. So if you get the virus, your immune system can handle it. If your immune system is too low, that's where you have all the serious problems with illness. But make sure you take the, vi anti, uh, the vitamins, you know, daily. Just make it a part of your life. Amen. 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 And uh, we can, I'm, I'm sure we can discuss other precautions we can all take and let's help each other out. But this this morning, well, the last time we were together, the last time I preached, we were talking about why, who remembers, who was here when I preached last time? Praise the Lord. We were talking about why faith, why you gotta have faith. And what we learned was that Thank you. What we learned was that uh, you gotta have faith because that's what Jesus is gonna be looking for when he comes. In order for you to make it in the last days, you need to have faith. Jesus says to them, when the Son of Man shall come, will he find faith on the earth? Do you know what that means? It means those that are going to make it in the end got to have faith. So that's why whatever you have been going through, whatever in all your life, this is what God has been doing for you. He's been building your faith. The trouble that you're going through is to build your faith. You know, exercise, I try to do exercise, and you know when you do push-ups and stuff? It's hard. But it strengthens, right? It strengthens your body. So that's what faith, that's what life through experience is. They are meant to strengthen our faith. Listen to this verse. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. I want you to focus on that word, taste. Why not put it on there? I put this here. Keeps loud in my, my reading glasses. 
Look at that word, taste. You know, when a mother prepares food and they prepare porridge or sometimes they, it's milk, they taste the food, right? Before they feed it to the child. You know why they do that? They make sure it's not too hot. So they taste to make sure the temperature is just right for the baby. See what Jesus did here? He tested death for us so that he could adjust it, so that he could regulate it, so that it does not destroy us. Do you know why we, we do you know why we, we will resurrect if we should sleep? Because Jesus has regulated death, he has tasted it. He has tasted death for us. So we have nothing to worry about. But that's not our sermon today. Our sermon today is the power of grace. This is part two of that sermon. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I'm in your hands. Use me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We talk about faith. Today, let's talk about grace. The power of grace. The scripture we shall make use of Genesis. 6 verse 8. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. If you find it, say amen. 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 But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. See, grace is perhaps the most misunderstood word of the, in all of the Bible. So let me ask this question. I'm going to ask maybe three people. What do you think grace is? Or what does it mean? Anybody? One? A gift of the Lord. Unmerited favor. Mm -hmm. Grace is the presence of the Holy Spirit giving us longevity. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible says uh, without uh, 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 what's the limitations? Faith is uh, great is our faithfulness. Mm -hmm. Our mercies is new every morning. Mm -hmm. So that's the Holy Spirit that's keeping us vital forces going in us, so we can serve Him better. I like that. The vital force to keep us going. Uh, okay, I see one hand, then I'll come to you, Brandon. One, yeah, go ahead, brother. Can just it. pick one. Yeah. What is it? Abundant favor. I love that. Amen. I love abundant favor. Brother Brendan. Um, an allowance to get right. Allowance to do right. An allowance to do right. Okay. All right. Let's see what the English, I looked it up on online on, on the, in the dictionary. It says uh, to. It could be uh, it, it could be a noun. Like uh, yeah. simple elegance. Or refinement of movement. You know, she moved through the water with effortless grace. Mm. All right? Oh, Ketir's goodwill. At least he has the grace to admit his debt to her, right? Uh, it can also be a verb. You know what a verb is? A doing word. We learned at school. So, to do honor or credit to someone or something by one's presence. She bowed out from the spot she, she had graced for two decades. You have graced us with your presence. See, that's a, ver a verb there. Now, I love all the definitions that you gave. And uh, I also look this one here on, in the Christian sense. It defines it as follows. It's the freely given 
unmerited favor and love of God. But that's not all that is. It says it's the influence or spirit of God operating in humans to regenerate or strengthen them. It's a, it's a virtue or excellence of divine origin. This, we see that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, another one, another example in the Bible of Genesis 8, 19, verse 18 says, And Lord said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. And thou hast magnified thy mercy which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain lest some evil take me and die, and I die. In the New Testament, it says, uh, Second Corinthians, I like this one, I, this is the one uh, I like in the new one. In the New Testament, it's Second Corinthians 12, verse 9, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. Amen. For my strength is made perfect in witness. Most gladly, therefore, that's Paul now speaking. Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Over. This is 2 Corinthians uh, 12, verse 9. And we often say we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus, right? That's Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. We are saved by grace through faith. So what does it mean to be saved by grace? What does it mean to be saved? Well, when we say, talk about being saved, we're talking about two things. Number one, getting the victory over sin. Amen. Right? Matthew 1, verse 21. And she and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So being saved, oftentimes we talk about Christians, what does it mean to be saved? This is the definition that they apply. But when we are saved, we are saved from something. We're not saved from starvation. We're not saved from being poor. We're, even, we're not even saved uh, from sickness. This is, not, this is not what it's talking about. This is talking, when we're talking about salvation, we're talking about being saved from sin. See the difference between the prosperity gospel and the real gospel. I want to uh, see if I can read you something here. To illustrate what I'm saying, uh, I posted this online the other day. And uh, let me, yeah, there, you, there it is. Okay. Because I had this, a uh, long time ago, I had this discussion with a, a friend. And uh, they were talking about being saved. And uh, and I said, and they were talking about, no, you know, Brother Kenny, it's not, we're always going to be sinning. We're always going to keep sinning because we are human. Okay? So I asked him, is it possible to live without sin? The answer was, no. Okay, I asked another question. Let me ask another question, I say. Can the devil tempt us to sin? And the answer was, yes, the devil can tempt us to sin. So do you believe that the power of the devil, that was me now, to tempt us to sin is greater than 
in God's power than the power of God to keep us from sinning? Well, the, the answer was, well, it's impossible for us to live without sinning. It's just human nature. We are human, right? And the question then I asked was, well, who taught Peter to walk on water? That answer was Jesus. And who say to us, who says to us, go sin no more, right? So you see, is it natural for Peter to walk on water? No. Is it our nature to walk on water? Yes. But he said to Peter, walk on water. Right. And then when he says to you, go sin no more, what's the problem there? <laughs> See, uh, <clears throat> so when we are saved from sin, we mean really escaping the domination of the devil, right? When we are saved from sin, you simply get another master, another ruler. The Bible says, Know ye not, that's Romans 6 16, know ye not that to that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. The second sense of being saved is when you we are talking about uh, being delivered from this sinful environment. This is at the second coming of Jesus. For 1 Corinthians 4, 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall, finish the sentence, rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. So this sermon uh, is about getting a new master so that sin shall not have dominion over you. We are talking about the power of grace. Let us look at a very interesting story in the Bible. I know you've probably read this many times, so I'm not going to read it. The story of Uriah the Hittite. Who's read the, the story of Uriah the Hittite? Anybody not familiar with the story of Uriah the Hittite? I don't want to assume. Anybody? Oh, my brother is not familiar. Well, we're going to have to read it then. Is that okay? Let us discuss. And by the way, thank you, brother, for coming. What? By the way, that's my brother from uh, Uganda. Welcome, welcome, welcome. His uh, family. His family is from, he's just from next door. I'm from further south in Zimbabwe. He's uh, a little bit north in Uganda. OK, so you're going to have to help me read the story then. Uh, we, let's go to Second Samuel. We'll start with uh, verse 11. Sorry, not verse, I mean chapter 11, my apologies. 11, chapter 11, we're going to read from verse 1. I need to, let's, let us read fast. Uh, let me first, let me, let me start, so then we'll pass it on to somebody else. Uh, now here we see uh, David is at, uh, the, the, the army is going to, to war, and he's at home. And he says here, it came to pass, starting verse 1, in the, after the year was expired, at the time when the kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed. Uh, they, sorry, and, and they and uh, destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem, and it came to pass in the in an even time that David arose from his bed. And what he get, getting restless, sleepless, and he walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Someone take it from there. Number verse three. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, 
the daughter of Eliam, mm -hmm. the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Wow. Continue, continue. And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, mm. for she was purified from her uncleanness, mm. and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, mm -hmm. I am with child. Oh. And, David, and David sent Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. Mm -hmm. And Joab sent Uriah the Hittite. To David. Oh, I'm sorry. And, and Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was coming to him, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. And David said unto Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. Brother mm -hmm. continue. Yes, but Uriah swept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to his house. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down unto his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey, why then didst thou not go down unto thy house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are in camp in the open field. Shall I then go into my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife, as thou livest and as thy souls liveth? I will not do this thing. And David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and on the morrow. Continue to Bethany. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk. And at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord. But went not down to his house. Okay, so let's just pause here for, for a sec. So we see who was who was Uriah? Uh, Uriah, he was a convert to the Jewish faith. Okay? You could say he was a, a naturalized citizen of Israel. He joined David's army. And he became part of the the cream of David's uh, brass military. And Uriah was a fierce fighter, you know. If you read Second uh, uh, Samuel twenty three verse thirty nine, he was amongst uh, the thirty seven's greatest fighters. So we see then David sees his wife, he takes her, he gets her pregnant, he, to hide the scandal, David summons Uriah, and he tries to make him go down to his, to his house so that he can be intimate with his wife. The reason so that they, everybody thinks that uh, the child is his, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? Nice. Uriah comes, but what, what does Uriah do? He refuses to go to his house. And so, the king looks at him and says, oh, man, okay, this plan A didn't work. He's going to go to plan B. He makes him drunk, right? And then uh, that didn't work. And you will see that here, the next uh, section, he uh, plots with the, the commander of the army to get him killed in the battlefield, right? So I will urge you to read the story and go all the way to verse 12, chapter 12, verse 7. And you see there that uh, the king plotted with the commander who was Jehoab and he had him killed in the battlefield. And so, see now that way he could, the reason he did that, so he could take the wife, the, the, the woman that he pregnanted, and then you can then pretend that the child was his conceived after marriage. 
Can you see the part there? Yeah. So they would say, well, he was born prematurely. You know, obviously he was going to show up eight months early. So, and God is displeased. And then he sends Nathan to rebuke David and pronounce his punishment. Okay, so that in, in a nutshell, that's the story of uh, Uriah. And the, the word, the name Uriah in Hebrew actually means Yahweh is my light. Or God is my light. And what we see about Uriah is that he was a Hittite. Uh, he was a foreigner. Right? So he was, as we say, a naturalized immigrant. But that did not stop him from adhering to his oath of office, even more than those who were natural born citizens of the nation of Israel. You see, I'm a naturalized U.S. citizen. So on that point, at least I can identify with the Uriah. And uh, when you're naturalized, you swear allegiance. You know, you actually study uh, quite a bit about the, the history of the country. And you study, you take, you actually take a test, you know. And you, you learn about the constitution, the government, how it's formed, how it, the country was founded, and all those wonderful things. So you actually, sometimes you end up knowing more than yeah, the, the people of, of the country, right? So Uriah was a bit like that. He saw allegiance to the Israelite constitution, which was the word of God, right? And he died in line of duty while serving honorably because he was a man of integrity. See, Uriah was a faithful man, a man upright in character, a man of integrity. Uh, he was faithful to the king who was not faithful to him. He, he was faithful to Joab who was not faithful to him. And he was faithful to his fellow soldiers. And he would not go and enjoy himself at home while they suffered the privations of the battlefield. He refused to go and have personal pleasure at home. Whilst the, 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 the battle was taking place, and he, but he was willing to go to the hottest part of the battle. You could say that he was selfless. He was faithful to his adopted nation, but those in power in that nation were not faithful to him. He was faithful to his new faith, but those who were born in that faith were not faithful to him. See, even God, it looks like God, you know, for the longest time, it looks like God even failed him. Because Uriah died. Right? So, you see, Uriah is not even, uh, he's not like in the Bible you hear about the heroes of faith. But Uriah was an ordinary person. In fact, even the story of Uriah, when you read the story of Uriah, it's, it's not even about Uriah. It's about David, isn't it? Like Uriah is a side note. But by the way, there was someone called Uriah. And this is what he did, ABC, and that's it. But the story is not, it's, it's about David. So Uriah, you know, is, is in a sense like you and me, an ordinary person, an ordinary Christian, if you will. You know, he's not like Abraham, you know, the father of faith, um, Moses. You know, pats the sea. He, he's not those great. He's not. He's just an ordinary soldier, an ordinary Christian. You, you know, we we have today uh, the, the the great evangelists. You know, it's funny. I I, I find you know, Seventh Day Adventists they're very interesting because, and I love Seventh Day Adventists. You you, you say something, and they're like, huh, huh. and and and, and a dark bachelor comes says the very same thing. Oh, hey man, 
praise the Lord. <laughs> so, I, we, we may never rise to that statue because they, they, they baptized thousands. You know, the, the dark bachelors and the, the other great evangelists that we have. But now today I'm just focusing on you and me, right? The, 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 the ordinary foot soldier of Christ. And uh, we see that Uriah, in spite of all the ordinariness, he lived a what? A life of integrity. Power corrupts. You've heard of saying. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely, right? Yeah. So power has a had an in, in, a corrupting influence on David, and he had become corrupted by power. Remember that young shepherd who had reminded everyone about God's presence on the battlefield as they faced Goliath and the Philistines. David, the sweet psalmist who played the harp and the demons fled from King Saul. Remember, he's the one who wrote the song, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That same David, he now begins to act as if there is no God in heaven, and that he's answerable to no one. See, now he's in control of another master. Remember Romans 6, 16? Know ye not? That to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. It's a, it's a spiritual principle that is eternal. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. There are only two centers of power that are vying for control of our hearts in the human race. There's only two centers of power. It's not the White House, and it's not uh, Muslim, or it's not some other earthly power. The only two, Christ and Satan. That's why it's called the great controversy between Christ and Satan. It's not the great controversy between the United States and Russia, no. It's the great controversy. Ultimately, everything boils down to the great controversy between Christ and Satan. See, at one time, all of our lives, we're in control of all of this. We're either under the control of one or the other. 